Welcome to the Mind Coaching Podcast. You can find more episodes on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Just search Mind Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Frank Nielsen, a Norwegian success mindset coach who alongside the podcast help business owners and sports people develop the mental skills they need to excel in stressful situations, achieve consistent success, and attain peak performance. Since I started making a podcast one year ago, I have the honor of interviewing some incredible people that you can check out after this episode. Professor Jordan B. Peterson, he's been a guest three times. Colin Brady, he's a two-time world record holder for Explorers Grand Slam and Seven Summit Speed Records. Travis Macy, he's an ultra-endurance athlete with over 130 ultra-endurance events in 17 countries. Chris Voss, he's a former lead international hostage negotiator for the FBI and many more. Now over to today's episode. In today's episode, I talk to Brian McKenzie. He's a human potential specialist. He has spent the last two decades in human performance learning about movement and physiology. He is the innovator of the endurance, strength and conditioning paradigm. He has studied performance, movement, hypoxia, breathing me- mechanics, principles and methods, along with heat and cold exposure. He has spent a lot of his time training and understanding in and around the water, desert and mountain environments. He has finished Ironman in 2004. He has run the Western States 100 and the Angels Crest 100 mile endurance runs with success in using his own methods. He has also co-authored the book Power Speed Endurance, the New York Times bestseller Unbreakable Runner and Unplugged. Mackenzie has worked with a lot of people. And to name a few, he has worked with uh, John Bon Jones, the UFC light heavyweight champion. He has also uh, worked with Rich Running and Laird Hamilton. In today's episode, we're talking about working with real champions, dumbbells in the water, optimal breathing techniques for sports and cycling, warm and cold therapy, breathing exercise for normal people, favorite breathing technique for maximum oxygen consumption, down-regulating at the end of the day, managing stress, and lots more. I really enjoyed this uh, conversation with Brian. uh, He has great knowledge, and he's very good at presenting his knowledge. So, thank you so much for listening, and please enjoy this episode with Brian McKenzie. Before we dive into training with dumbbells underwater and different breathing techniques, uh, Brian, and how it is to work with uh, work with the world champions like John Jones and Rich Running. How did you become a performance specialist and a best-selling author? When did it all begin? It probably started when I was four. Um, <laughs> four? <laughs> yeah, because well, yeah, my curiosity or my passion, I think, for trying to understand things from a performance level, um, I, 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 I want to say that I've always had this competitive edge to me, but I don't know that it's competition. Um, the competition side for me is kind of an internal thing. I'm not necessarily like everybody enjoys winning, right? Like if you race, everybody kind of, you know, I don't know anybody who doesn't really enjoy winning. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, but the, the, the absolute need to win has not been a part of my life all the time. And I, and I, you know, I got very good. I I was started as a swimmer. So I I was kind of thrown into high level swimming at a very young age at at about four. (laughs) Well, I I was just, I was good at it. I was good at it. So they put me, yes. Wow. Yeah. So I, I, I just took to the water really well. Um, and started doing swim meets at at the age of four and, you know, it it was scary and it was terrible. And I I actually vividly remember my first swim meet and I had to swim the I am and I did it wrong. And I got out of the pool and, and I, and I ran over to my mom and I, and, you know, and I, and I, and I had to leave, I didn't want to go back, you know, but I can't, I, you know, I ended up going back to practice. I ended up doing things and, and, and this is, this has all evolved into things to where I grew up in, in a place called Orange County, California that in, you know, I was born in the 70, early seventies, but I, my, my adolescence was in the eighties and, and I became a teenager in the eighties and I, my, my youth was spent 
in the epicenter of one of the largest punk rock scenes that's ever been had. And, and not to mention where skateboarding evolved. Um, and so these were my heroes and these were the things that I really looked up to. And so hence why I'm very tattooed um, is my, the people I saw and looked up to were very tattooed. Um, you know, you're a byproduct of an environment that you stick yourself in. And, and, and to anybody that tries to challenge that, I, I dare you to go live somewhere for five to 10 years and, and try and not evolve <laughs> into that, you know, area. And, and, and that's just what it is. And, um, you know, I, I've watched it in Hollywood. I've watched it everywhere. You know, you can't, you can't hide from it, but sport was always a part of my life, whether it was swimming or water polo or soccer, what you football, um, or, uh, skateboarding, surfing. I, I started these things at very young ages and they became a part of my existence and my understanding of things, which transpired into human movement and, and, you know, taking kinesiology classes and PE classes, I became very, uh, interested in things for the first time in my academic career. I was very bored with school when I was in elementary school, when I was in junior high and high school. Um, I, I was, so I went to as little school as possible in order to stay eligible to, to play my sport and graduate. Um, and, and then when I got to college and decided and found some classes that I liked, things really changed. Uh, on, you know, and, and, but things evolved from there into a lot of other different areas as well. And, and I found kinesiology in the direction that it went and, you know, PE physical education in the direction it was going and exercise science in the direction it was going. I didn't like it. <laughs> I, I, I became, I questioned a lot of it, or I had a lot of questions that could not be answered. And so I had to go to other people for those things. And thank God I was like as curious as I was. And this is what I, I think is the ultimate, you know, way to learn is just remaining curious about things. Uh, you said uh, that in, uh, in um, kinesi kinesiology. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, what, what did you not find there, uh, Brian, that you were searching for? You, you know, I, the understanding of, of, There, there's more, there's more to, you know, how mus muscles actions than, um, origin insertion and what that muscle does, uh, like in terms of whether it's flexing or extending like stability and how it stabilizes and why it's stabilizing and how gravity has uh, you know, it's, it's role within what, how we move and nobody was talking about these things. And so I started asking questions and nobody could answer the questions, not the people teaching. And so it was, I had to go elsewhere and that, that, and that's why I, you know, really ventured outside of these things. And, and because I saw missing some, some missing parts, but I, I had questions first. I didn't question it. I had questions and those couldn't be answered. And because those couldn't be answered, I felt that I wasn't in the right place for me. And I needed to go to where people who could answer my questions or lead me in the proper direction were at. Uh, are a detail oriented person in uh, Ryan? To some degree. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, I, I think it all becomes, I, I think my, my, my view is that everything is an art and it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that we don't, that not everybody can look at it like that. Um, but I, you know, I don't necessarily need the world to view things the way I do. Um, but, but I think we've really mixed up what art really is. And so when we say art, the arts, you know, we look at things like, you know, sculptures or paintings or, you know, drawings or, you know, You know, we're finally like, for instance, let's use cooking as an example. Cooking in the 1980s and early 90s, nobody gave, a, nobody cared at all about cooking or what chefs did. Now people recognize chefs as artists. 
and 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 being from Norway, you know this. Like you have some very high level chefs, and even in the Scandinavian culture, there are very high level chefs that are being recognized for their bringing back original or 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 um, the the Norwegian or even Scandinavian foods and doing them in a different way than they've always been done, but keeping to the cultural detail that's always been there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And 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 it's unfortunate because the the unfortunate part for me is that people don't recognize their own careers as something like that and you know i have looked at my career as not a career but as this is just fun and 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 this is a light i'm using a light on how i see things and i'm so that that creates a specific detail with how i see it i don't that doesn't mean I need to take the detail on of where, where, you know, what somebody else sees it as it's, here's how I see it. Here's how they see it. Not neither one's wrong, neither one's right, but it's both. If we can all, if we can look at it both, we now have what's really beautiful and, and the ability to see things in many different aspects. And so what you're talking about is perspective. So, yes, so your 100%. Pers- yeah. So your perspective is, uh, looking at in in some kind of arts. Uh, uh, do you know about the last uh, study that came out of Stanford about uh, two or three weeks ago about perception? No. Uh, it came a perception uh, or a study from perception uh, that was uh, done uh, with over 60,000 uh, male ad- uh, adults from the US over 21 years uh, period. And the study shows that uh, people that are, do have the same kind of uh, activity, but the one person have the perception of the hate training and they feel that they are in bad condition, and this uh, another person uh, have um, had perception of uh, being in the great uh, condition and they love their exercise. The people that have a negative perception about training, they have seventy one percent more likely to die earlier than the other uh, group 70 so the negative th- so the negative thinkers were 71% more likely to ha- to die earlier yeah yeah well that goes that comes back to things like i mean we could talk about <laughs> that's pretty amazing right 71% very but very but but that falls in line with everything i've ever thought and and experienced is I don't look at my, what I do is a job, you know, people are like, what do you do for a living? And I, and it's almost like, I don't know, <laughs> but I get, you know, people pay me to come talk and people pay me to come do things and, and show them what I've learned. Um, so I'm doing something. Um, but Bruce Lipton wrote a book called the biology of belief. Yeah. yeah. And, and this falls right in line with it. And, and this also comes into theory with where science is going, you know, and some theories about, you know, our existence and are we existing in a parallel universe or multiple <laughs> universes? And is, is it all just what, because the fact is, is all you have to do is think it. And as long as you think it, that's what we exist. And history is nothing more than stories. So your story, Frank, is history. And how you tell that story becomes your art and we are nothing more than storytellers. And the only thing, yeah. And the only thing predictable about history is behavior. Yeah. And that's, true. yeah. So it, oh, it, that, was, very- that was a nice perception, Ryan. <laughs> but was it this uh, kind of perception on the world view that uh, led you into being a New York times bestseller with uh, unbreakable runner? It was, uh, yes. I mean, it was, it was learning from my mistakes and learning from things that weren't working. Um, you know, like being in pain or, um, you know, um, progression, um, addiction, um, you know, a lot of things that we as human beings all experience on some level or another. And, you know, what, what, what is, you know, you know, one of the definitions of insanity, repeating the same thing over and over, expecting a different result, you know, (laughs) you know, and and being honest with myself about a lot of this stuff and, you know, but making it, you know, 
it's very difficult to be honest with yourself and go, oh, oh, maybe I'm not doing this in the most effective manner. It coming to terms with that, but then figuring out a way to make yourself passionate about learning a different way or a different thing. And that's where the curiosity has to come in. So how do you trigger curiosity and how do you stay curious? Uh, constantly being open to new ideas and thinking and trying to, you know, I, I, you know, not trying, but I, I, you know, I have a network of people that I'm surrounded by that think very similar to me. Um, very open. Um, it's global at this point, you know, so it, it's not in one, one little area of Orange County that I'm getting my, you know, my punk rock education from. It's a global thing with people who are bouncing ideas off of stuff to where, you know, now I, I get to be involved with people that are very much more educated than me, um, have, you know, uh, who, who are much more fine tuned in certain areas than I ever can be and, and can create a spark with inside my own mind that allows me to become curious about something they may not be looking at. And, and that drives me and that can help them, you know, and, and that, that's all this is. And the ability to share that, you know, I, I, you know, the last, this last book I wrote unbreakable or uh, unplugged, um, with Dr. Andy Galpin, it is an amalgamation of, hey, we're in a world that is very technologically advanced. I mean, I'm doing a podcast with you and you're in Norway and I'm in central Oregon. And it's a uh, it, it, it's a, it's an amazing thing if it's treated as an amazing thing. You know, it can be a very, very negative thing, too, if it's and, and this is anything. And so that's what Unplugged really is about is our ability in performance to understand when we're getting away from what our natural ability really is. And I think that's largely our biggest problem is we're trying to hack nature and nature really isn't hackable. Yeah. And I think that's an uh, extremely important issue. And the reason I'm talking to you, Brian, I do not have a background from, uh, from uh, being an athlete, but uh, I uh, experienced panic attacks in the uh, ice now soon seven years ago. Uh, and it and the panic attacks didn't panic attacks didn't stop, so I had to find a solution for myself, and uh, that led that led me into uh, going deep into psychology and start working as a mental trainer, uh, and and it's the same curiosity because uh, when you realize one thing, it's a new thing. <laughs> one door opens, another another door closes, and I think that uh, this curiosity is important because it's always new ideas. Like uh, two years ago, I become aware of Wim Hof. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and the first time I heard about Wim Hof, I think it was at uh, the Tim Ferriss uh, podcast. I think. And when he and when he explained uh, how his breathing techniques uh, worked and how it and how he discovered it, I became really curious. And uh, I've been using it now for uh, two years. Uh, yeah, I think it's two years. Uh, and I know that you also have some experience with the Wim Hof method and other breathing techniques, uh, Brian. Can you elaborate yes. on that one? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I I ran into Wim about five years, close to five years ago. Um, and... We, I ended up reaching out after I went through his course because I, I, once I ran into it, once I started doing it, I automatically knew there was something more to this and, and there was application that they may not know about, just like what I've talked about with you. And I started applying it to other things and found it to be a very interesting way to play with performance. What other things? And, <laughs> well, for instance, you know, if you, what, so w w the w Wim Hof method is, we've classified it as one of a variant of super ventilation techniques. So we say super ventilation because anything that is a conscious action to hyperventilate is not hyperventilation. Hyperventilation is a chronic problem that people have. And so 
Um, although it's a form of hyperventilation, we're classifying it as a superventilation practice. It's one of, you know, several, uh, but for instance, holotropic breathing, which came across in the seventies by a guy by the name of Stanislav Grof is a very similar form of hyperventilation technique. It's also a superventilation technique. There's also things like breath of fire, Kabbalah Bhati. These are in yoga and they come, you know, and all of these things have been there and they've come with very stern warnings as to their use and why. And as does now Wim. Um, and, and so we found that there was a lot of cro- like crossover with these things. And, and, and so we started looking back deeper than where Wim has been. And that's what led me to other techniques and other things. And we use several different techniques um, outside of hyperventilation or superventilation stuff because we found that a lot of the the issues that don't get solved are CO2 tolerance issues um, where if I have a poor CO2 tolerance issue inside my lungs – unconscious, which is 95% of your day, your body has to rebreathe. So, or, or it ha- you need to over breathe and it, it'll do this automatically. And so we throw the pH off, we throw the body off, um, our oxygen absorption levels are off. And in the quest that I've taken on, when I was looking at performance This was actually a bigger perform. This was actually a huge problem in athletes, even at the elite level. We, I mean, they were dealing. Most elite athletes have anxiety disorders of some sort, and the problem with that is that they're they use the sport or the athletics, and I'm speaking from personal experience. So is that we're hiding from something and we're using the sport or the athletics to not have to deal with it because we literally can bury ourselves in endorphins and hormones and all of these things and we can make everything feel okay and then not have to go and deal with it. And unfortunately, that has major repercussions in the long term. And and that's what we were seeing very early on. And so... The, what happened was, is that when we started looking at athlete CO2 tolerance levels, we started connecting anxiousness to it and anxiety stuff to it. And we were able to eradicate a lot of the issues with some very high performers immediately just through chain doing some breath work. And it That'd wasn't necessarily yeah. just Wim, and it wasn't just Wim Hof stuff. I think like, look. Wim Hof has done a phenomenal job and is a phenomenal method and I love him to death, but there are a multitude of different things that different people need and it's not all one, a one-stop shop. And that was something we picked up on very early on. I really, really, really agree with you, Herr Brian, because I remember from, um, having uh, anxiety myself and uh, I'm working with clients and having uh, anxiety issues these days uh, also athletes uh, and uh, m- mostly the anxiety part is in your breath as soon as uh, of, of course you know this uh, as soon as you're getting anxious you stop uh, you start to, to shallow breathe and when yes. you start to shallow breathe you're getting more cortisol and adre- adrenaline so I'm uh, I'm curious. Can you elaborate on a breathing technique uh, that people can use to calm themselves? Yeah, I mean the simplest thing is just slowing your breathing down and going into nasal breathing. If you're nasal breathing only in and out, you're automatically setting yourself up for parasympathetic state. S- yeah, the moment you open your mouth, you're in a sympathetic ma- state. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't so know that. there's number one. Yeah, that's number one. Okay. So think about it. If I go into cold water, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Right? Yeah. Okay. And, and that's just an extreme version of it. But for, when you had your panic attacks and for people who have anxiousness, and we all have some form of it, we're not special. 
Like, uh, yes, you are, Frank. You're a good guy. You're a special guy. But, <laughs> Thank you, Brian. <laughs> like, look, we all have the same issues. I, I've seen this with drug addicts and, and alcoholics, like, who think they're so very special. They have very special problems because they're addicts. No. I've seen the same thing within the athletic world and the business world and everything for people who don't drink uncontrollably, but they're using other things as mechanisms for this. And these are called, these are called coping mechanisms. And part of our physiology is, is that when we get into an anxious state, we're unconscious of our breathing and breathing is the remote control to the brain. So, it's a chicken or the egg concept to a large degree, but if I can control my breathing, I can control my the physiology to my brain. True. And so even though I have negative thoughts or bad thoughts going on, if I can control my breathing in a manner to slow it down to a large degree, I can actually control that state. So something simple like you know, a slow inhale, a brief breath hold and a slow exhale and just repeating that in a manner that allows you to repeat it on the same pattern can ultimately change state in a matter of seconds. I have um, seen that box breathing has uh, had a great benefit. Box breathing is a great example. So that works it off of a one, 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 one cadence. So if I have a four second inhale, I've got a four second breath hold, I've got a four second exhale, and I've got a four second pause or exhale breath hold on the end. And I just repeat that pattern and do things. It's a great way for people to learn how to do stuff. But <laughs> box breathing's not the answer. <laughs> nor is Wim Hof the answer, nor is pranayama nor is kundalini, nor is none of it's the answer. The answer is you, and you have to be able to, to explore specific places where you're being affected. To say that if I inhaled for five seconds, held my breath for 10 seconds, exhaled for five seconds, and then held my breath on an exhale for 10 seconds, that couldn't be more effective. And that of things was where there was no one set protocol that basically set every person up. And this is where the work that we're now doing with Stanford Medicine has gone is we're working in a fear and anxiety setting for research and we've developed protocols based on people's fingerprints okay. due to emotional okay. reactivity. Yes. Oh, elaborate <laughs> if you can. Yeah. So, well, we the, the idea is is because what we were seeing is there was no one stop shop for anybody. Like, like even though I love Wim Hof, it's not necessarily the best thing for me to do every day. Now, Wim Hof might disagree, but. <laughs> I found that if I actually, I, I didn't improve my CO2 tolerance by doing Wim Hof method. And so to improve my CO2 tolerance, I needed to find a specific pattern that worked for me and allowed me to progress. And there's several different patterns that we could use, right? But I found out that I'm a type A personality and I'm a very sympathetic dominant person. Hence having, yeah. And so it, I don't necessarily need to always be ramp. I don't need to use external things to ramp me up. Think of Wim Hof as caffeine or coffee. Okay. It, it's a simple, just a simple analogy. Hmm. A lot of people like caffeine and coffee and they, and they drink it every day. And that's not necessarily a problem, but there's a lot of people who probably shouldn't be and don't need to be right now on the flip side of that. There are people who probably need to be using some more caffeine and, and drinking some coffee. And so, there, so it's figuring out these, how these relate or, or how we get and figure those people out. And so we, we, um, they, Stanford is human who I'm, do, who we're doing the research with at Stanford medicine 
has a screen. It's a 21 question test that's based off of a Harvard uh, study and it's called the emotional reactivity scale. And it's a 21 question test. And so we run through that test with them and we're able to understand people's emotional reactivity to things. So their emotions and their reactivity to that. It basically tells us who's who's highly sympathetic driven, who's highly parasympathetic driven, because there are very different people out there to a large degree. And within that, we know we've figured out which protocols work best with specific groups and which don't. And so we lend the protocols Then we get a snapshot of their CO2 tolerance. So we know where to start them off with a specific number and we can automatically change somebody's anxiety levels just through giving them their own fingerprint for breathing. And it's something they can do in 10 breaths. I believe that. uh, I believe that, Brian, because I've seen it myself uh, from uh, from uh, myself and customers that uh, uses different breathing uh, techniques. But you said that uh, Wim Hof can in some way uh, be seen as uh, caffeine. I have seen that people that are extremely anxious using uh, the Wim Hof method to become more calm. Wait, wait, wait repeat that? Yeah. Sorry. I have seen the clients using the Wim Hof method, uh, the breathing technique, to become more calm when they are anxious. Uh, yes. Wh- what's it, th- yes, it has that effect. It can have that effect. It can also have the opposite effect. Okay. And that's where I knew that there was more, way more out there because some people don't react well to that. Hmm. How to do that you, protocol. How, how do you and, react? Uh, I I enjoy it. I I like I, I get a very calm sense, but I get fu- I, I'm like ready to do things. <laughs> If I do it at night. I don't calm down. I say I rant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But I also know that there are people who get very, very sympathetic, dominant, and don't come down because they don't like all those chemicals coming into being flooded into the system, and so they have an adverse reaction. I know people that have gotten incredibly emotional when they do it and do not like it. What kind of breathing technique? What, te- kind, of- uh, what kind of breathing technique do you recommend for a person that is high symp- in the sympathetic, sympathetic uh, nervous system? I, I think there's. I, I think everybody should be working on something that's helping them downregulate, and so that could be something where you're doing something like a box breathing, which will downregulate you, um, or you're doing some sort of cadence work. Uh, you know, like a, you know, like a one, one, two, one, um, or apnea work like free divers do. These are very calming, but they're also, they can also be, if you're pushing them, they can develop CO2 tolerance levels at a very high level. You can also go into things like the Buteco method, which is the Buteco method is a rough. They used to use it in Russian medicine as the first line of defense for asthma. And they teach people how to more or less do tolerance. So they get their, um, the Buteco method teaches people how to take very small breaths, but very slow. Okay. If uh, we go a little way away from the breathing part, uh, you're also working with uh, John Jones, I understand. I, yes, I have worked with John Jones. Yes, yeah. uh, and I've also worked with Rich Froning. Is yeah. I worked with Rich Froning several years ago. Yes, yeah, you have been working with the best athletes in the world. What is uh, the common trait that you see in these uh, world performers at their best? The, the like, if you look at somebody like Rich Froning, and you look at somebody like John Jones, you look at somebody like Laird Hamilton, you start to see people who are highly, highly driven, but are also very focused on one goal. And the other commonality is, is that they're all open to learning or remaining curious about what else they could be doing. And thus 
They're never following anybody else's program. They're there. They are literally doing their own training. So as the world finds out what they're doing, they're already looking for new things to do. Yeah. How is it to work with that kind of people that are uh, finding the best things and just going for their own uh, kind of program? Oh, um, it, it's it's fun because it, it, we're very similar in that they're wanting to learn new things and I'm out there learning new things. <laughs> they're using it for performance. And although I'm in performance, I'm doing it to try and understand more about what we are capable as a species of. Uh, what kind of breeding technique uh, would you uh, recommend for John Jones, for example? Because he looks extremely calm as he, as he already in the octagon. Well, it, it's interesting because, yeah, he's he, he is <laughs> in the octagon, but, you know, the analysis... So the, in- the conversation John and I had before he went out to fight for the world championship was that it's a story that I tell about that I got from this guy, Marcus Rogan, who's a, who's a psychologist and works with, um, very, very, uh, um, anxious, anxiety prone, autistic people. And the story is, is that, you know, when a lion and hunts the antelope, the, there is no difference physiologically from either animal and the the lion is in a state of i need to eat to survive or i will die and the antelope is i need to get away or i will die <laughs> and, and but but the difference is between them is is not physiological it's it's a conscious thing and the lion wants to be there and the antelope does not and so even though john is entering a ring and doing what he wants to do that does not take away the fact that he's getting in a ring and he's fighting and anybody and everybody has been in a fight at some point in their life whether it was an argument or whether it was a fist fight right there is always heightened response. There's always going to be that heightened response. It's how we cope with or deal with that that becomes the reality. And so all we did, we, we basically just did a calming sequence that that really opened him up. Um, and then we ramped him up a little bit to upregulate something very reminiscent of Breath of Fire and, 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 and Wim Hof-esque. And then we went right back into something that would calm him back down. Um, and this allows for the physiology to kind of go up and get excited about something and get almost into a flow like state and then be focused and ready to do things. And then we did some warm up sequence stuff where we did some hypoxic work where it re- you really can warm your body up a lot quicker by doing hypoxic work and get your, your pulmonary system, respiratory system warmed up in conjunction with your muscular and cardiovascular system. Something that we've largely failed at. Uh, what is hypoxic uh, workout? What is Holding that? your breath, l- large, holding your breath without air. Okay. Why do you, do you become uh, warmer, faster by doing that one? Yes. Why? Yes. Why? 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 Like, <laughs> if you just hold your breath sitting there and, and until you can't hold your breath and then take one breath in, and hold your breath again as long as you can and keep repeating that, you will warm up really quickly. <laughs> yeah, because your blood pressure is rising. Yes, and your the carbonic acid in the blood is rising and in your lungs. And so we're 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 basically raising everything in order to get it fired up, right? So we're putting ourselves into this place where we're able to warm the body up and, and system up. Now, there, there's a systematic approach to it, which would take a while to go over. But in terms of getting somebody, you know, we, we use a lot of hypoxic training within the constructs of what we do as it has incredible implications on red blood cells and, and, and hemoglobin. So, I mean, you can train for altitude without being at altitude. Ooh. 
interesting. <laughs> But I have to ask you, uh, you said something in, uh, I think it was the podcast I heard it, uh, that uh, cyclists, when they are doing a tempo race, yep. they have a uh, wrong posture that is um, um, uh, preventing them from doing the right kind of uh, breathing. Uh, can you talk a little about the right breathing technique and the optimal position for a cyclist, for example? Well, one, most most cyclists are pretty kyphotic. So they have a really, really rounded spine. So, okay. <laughs> so if I'm slouched over and I try to take a breath, I don't get much air in. I can still get air in, but if I sit up straight... I have a lot more room for air, right? So this is this was why I actually got into breath work was because I understand movement and better positions. And when when we have bad posture, we compensate elsewhere for that. And so if I have a cyclist who's kyphotic, I know already that they have way more room for improvement just based off of putting their lungs in a better position to expand further and get more access to air, right? And and that, in essence, allows for performance changes. It also teaches somebody to get into a better position versus sacrificing position for the lack of mobility. Let's take, for example, running. I've also seen some of your running videos. Uh, what's the reason that uh, your system or your understanding is so much uh, more beneficial than other kind of well, programs. I, we, we look at movement in, in general, like human movement, not runners movement. We don't go and go, Oh, well, this is what most runners look like. So that's what we're going to do. That's not how it works. Not, not, not the way I see it. Um, we, we're designed to be in a good position to support ourselves through the skeletal system and the muscle muscles are not there. The muscles are there to serve as body weight, not body weight there to service muscles. <laughs> and so we tend to in exercise science, allow the athlete to dictate or groups of athletes to dictate what we should be teaching versus the reality of it. And, and the best analogy I can give you is if I put Um, you know, if I put a barbell or I put something over my head, right. If I put my hands out wider to keep it out there, it's because I'm lacking range of motion in my shoulders. Right. But I'm stacked on top of my skeleton here. As I come out, I'm not stacked on that skeleton anymore. I'm having to use muscles to compensate For what the skeletal structure should be doing. So within running, what we the pro, one of the biggest problems we see is that most runners have very tight anterior hips. So the front of the hip is very tight. That does not allow for a lot of hip extension. In fact, most runners are missing hip extension. And hip extension is a necessity for human movement. <laughs> so when I don't come into hip extension correctly, what I do is my pelvis turns over and I overextend and create more extension or bowing in my low back to make up for that. And that bowing or, or th that, that excessive extension does not allow me access to my diaphragm. If my spine is not in alignment, I don't move correctly and I don't breathe correctly. How can people uh, find out if they are doing this wrong? Do they just feel that it's, uh, it's hard or how? <laughs> if you're doing this for 20 years, how do you understand that you're doing it wrong? The best way is to find a good coach who knows how to look at things like this. Yeah. Uh, I've, I read, here's, yeah. Here's, here's the easiest thing too. Pain. Pain is nature's way of saying wrong and knowing the difference between I'm choosing to suffer or I'm choosing to run through this knee that's hurting me or, or, or my back hurts. Um, like that is the difference. Like if I have pain, 
animals don't largely have pain. They stop doing things that hurt them. We don't. Idiots. <laughs> well, we, we sit most of the day. We um, talk all day. Um, we're on computers. We're on our fin- You know, we're, we, we do things that are very outside of how we've evolved. It's not that these things are bad. It's how we're doing it. And what are we doing to go around that? And that's how I look at things. And, and so when you look at somebody who wants to run a marathon or something and they can't actually be an extension. So their feet turn out like a duck um, when, when they run or even when they walk, the first thing I tell them is, well, first we need to work on your mobility and get your feet straight because you, your hips don't actually work the way they're designed. You're on a ball and socket. So you should be able to move around, but you can't because you're so tight and bound down that your feet are compensating for this action, which is also telling me you can't, you're not breathing correctly. And why does it uh, tell you that you're not breathing correctly just because your hips is wrong? Is it because of a- well, it's a, it's largely a spinal fault. Okay. So if I'm tight in my in my hips. I'm going to compensate through my extremities, which means I'm missing something with inside my spine. So the spine is the epicenter for everything in movement. So I must prioritize my spine before I do anything. That doesn't mean my spine can't move. It just means I need to be able to understand how my body is going to move and I'm going to move freely without compensating with motion. So if my hips lack motion, I have to understand where my limits are. And that is so if I if I'm if I can be an extension and let's just say uh 10 degrees. So my foot can be 10 degrees behind my hip, right? But any further than that and my foot starts to rotate out. So it starts to turn out At that point, my spine, because I'm going to keep my foot on the ground, and as I turn out, my spine compensates. So I honk, and I make up for it through my back. It's why a cyclist continues to round their back to get into a better position on the bike versus turning the hip over and getting more access to their hamstrings and their glutes which are more powerful, right? And I'm not saying that every cyclist needs to do this, but a, the large majority of cyclists are missing these things. And is it any wonder that when we do see elite level cyclists, the con- in a sport that has no contact with the ground, so there's no eccentric loading, we see knee problems or we see ankle problems or we see hip problems. And it's like, you don't have, like the only reason that's happening is because you're compensating with leverage and your leverage is off because you're not accessing your true mechanics and you become very quad dominant as a cyclist or as anybody, you know, whatever you, we're supposed to be a little bit more congruent. Now, the, the irony in all of this is the body will adapt to a large degree to most of this for some time. So stretching, we, we are, what's that? So stretching is important for, for, uh, Uh, I think mobility is important. You know, people ask me about yoga all the time. And I think the idea behind yoga is great. Um, and a lot of the stuff with yoga is amazing. And the fact that they've incorporated breath work into it. And I think it's, you know, that it's, there's a reason why it's thousands of years old. That, that said, I have not really run into too many yogis, people who practice yoga that actually understand mobility. And mobility is being in a stable position and being able to hit end range with a joint. So uh, how can people uh, learn this stuff <laughs> and do it? The easiest, way, the easiest way is through my good friend, Dr. Kelly Starrett. Okay. And he has a website called Mobility wad wod.com and 
he has changed human performance through this medium and, and getting people to understand the difference between mobility and flexibility and flexibility is a passive thing largely. And there's nothing passive about how we do things until we lay down in bed until we lay down on the ground, we should be understanding how to be stable and in a good position. And because of the lifestyles that we've gotten into, we, we put ourselves to be lazier and lazier and lazier and not understanding what good posture is. And so let's say I want to stretch my hamstrings, right? So I'll just show you real quick. A lot of people, if I said, go down and touch your toes, they round their back and they touch their toes, right? Mobility says, no, I want to see your hamstrings. So now I've got a stable spine and I've turned my hip over and we are now just accessing my hamstrings versus allowing my spine to compensate for my lack of interesting. mobility. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, what led you to doing dumbbells underwater? Oh, that's Laird. Laird <laughs> Hamilton. <laughs> what What's the purpose of doing dumbbells underwater? He found that... Um, so Laird is arguably one of the greatest. But he, he's he's easily the most influential big wave surfer that's ever he's lived. He's a machine. Yeah, and he doesn't like to swim laps, and he needed a training regimen for the off season, and so he understood that holding your breath underwater was good, but doing that statically does not mimic having an eighty foot wave or a hundred foot wave dropped on your head. And so swimming with dumbbells really started to mimic that entire thing and learning how to swim with a lot of heavy weight and move around with a lot of heavy weight in the water teaches you how to survive in situations that you normally wouldn't know. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a revolutionary program to understand water competency. Um, I, I being somebody who has a swimming background believe it's easily something that every human being should be learning to do so that they don't because swimming laps and, 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 and technique are great. Um, but that's not, what's going to save your life. If you're caught out in a riptide or you're in deep water. I think I'll be running out of time here, Brian, but uh, can you elaborate a little bit uh, about warm and cold therapy? The, uh, warm and cold therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I played around with heat for a number of years and found that there was a lot of benefit in learning how to mitigate heat, especially for performance. But that happened due to the fact that I was actually just training to go be out in extreme heats and pace people through races and participate in extreme races that were in extreme heat. And, and found out that from a performance perspective, it helps in any case. So physiology is largely an infinite thing in that it allows you to say, I could do this and my physiology is going to change, but it does come at a cost. So the heat training largely can help with a lot of things that are very similar to endurance training, releasing heat shock proteins, um, growth hormone release. You can get incredible amounts of growth hormone that'll happen. There's cleansing through sweating, um, all of that. And then the cold actually has very similar adaptations as well, which allows your body to start to repair, heal. Um, it builds a better immune system. Um, it, it, it's a great medium for really expressing how well you can do under high levels of stress because nobody likes the cold and the cold really exposes a lot of holes in, in what's going on with you. Um, and, and so the ability uh, we're, we're largely, um, adapted to 70 degrees Fahrenheit and we don't really drift from that. And, you know, if it snows, we put on, warm clothing to stay really warm and, and, and to stay at about 70, 75 degrees. And we keep our homes 70, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And so 
getting better cold exposure allows you to mitigate the cold better and adapt to the cold better. And the fact is, is our physiology is designed for this. And we have things like cold shock proteins that, that allow the body to adapt to things. And so the cells legitimately will either adapt to the heat or the cold. But if we don't use them, then you don't adapt. And so it becomes a very difficult place to be. Um, they can be used as performance gainers. They can be used as recovery protocols. Um, it's really infinite. It's a lot like the breath work, but the breath work goes really well hand in hand with heat and ice. Mm. So uh, pushing uh, beyond the comfort zone is important to understand. <laughs> yes, to a large degree, but there's a lot of research surrounding these things that there are a lot of physiological benefits to employing them. It's why Scandinavian countries have always done things like saunas. Yeah, and ice baths. Yes. Mm. Yes. <laughs> is there something I haven't asked you, Brian, that you think is important to get into this uh, conversation? Not that I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have been uh, into a wide uh, a range of uh, areas. Thank you so much for your time, Brian. It was uh, really interesting, and you're really good at uh, delivering the message. So, well, thank you. So thank, thank you, Frank. Thank you so much for taking the time, Brian. You're welcome.